Hi, this is Paul. I'm trying to put out a video quickly before I gotta catch a plane, and so that'll it'll come out tomorrow. Um, yesterday, put out a couple of different videos. I had a Thief in the Night live stream, and I clipped about 20 minutes of it, where we talked a little bit about some of my ideas behind um, the religion beneath the current events. Um, I also put out, some of you noted I was a little worked up in the beginning of the video. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply annoyed at evangelical leadership with respect to how they are conceptualizing the kinds of debates that are going on. Now, none of us can see clearly enough or see the whole picture, but we ought to do the best we can. And when I look at the way some evangelical leaders lead, I think, it's, it's not even competent. Now, maybe others will look at me and say it's not competent. It's, competence can be thrown around in terms of a difference of opinion. But there are historical visions beneath the various positions and especially the various civilizations that are in some ways at war. And all of these have, to one degree or another, cultural roots that are deeply tied to their religious frameworks. Now, now, a lot of this is, there's so much intermingling. It's not like we're dealing with distinct systems, but there are tendencies and aspects that um, continue to manifest themselves even as things move on through history. Part of what's interesting to me about the moment we're in is that there is sort of an agent arena relationship in terms of participation. Whenever there's a conflict, they're always sort of, well, I'm with this guy or I'm against that person or I I don't like that person because what he said, yada, yada, yada. And it always sounds a little bit um, like a junior high playground. There are a lot of different voices on the scene. Listen to what they have to say. Evaluate them contest the ideas, uh, wrestle with the egregores if you must. That's really, I think, a lot of what we're doing. But, um, you know, treat the image bearers with respect, or at least try to, if you don't get too trollish like I sometimes get. So I, I got to be careful about pointing fingers. So when the Jordan Peterson conversations with Robert Kagan, uh, I hadn't listened to it. I'm not quite through listening to it. I'm about two-thirds, three-quarters of the way through right now, but I don't have any more time to sit and finish that before I do this. I'll, I'll listen to it on the plane tonight. But a lot of the early stuff in the conversation I thought was quite helpful information. Now, again, it's, it's limited information. It's contested information. Almost any information we have about such large things like this is. Now, remember, again, I, I loved Jordan Peterson's illustration of a helicopter that he had with Kurt Jemungle, where Russia is magnitudes of complexity larger than a helicopter, okay? And history is enormously complex. And so all of our attempts to grasp and to understand and engage are always limited. So let's let's talk to each other, let's debate each other, let's differ with each other and and let's try and get at better truth if we can. So I do want to play some of the rest is history podcast when we get at some of the roots of this of the West, but I thought I'd start with some of the Jordan Peterson conversation with Robert Kagan because I wanted to strengthen some of the points that I had made on the Protestantism was a hole in the culture where the church used to be video, or that, that part of the thief in the night conversation that we had. Now, now this was posted on the 28th, and as anybody following the news will see that this situation, this war has moved, hasn't moved quickly in the way that Russia would like it to, but every day there's more news. And so even a conversation that is four days old will be dated. And so that's part of the reason to talk about bigger things and not just the, the particulars, but you have to talk about what you know so far. So let's do a little bit of that before they get into the history. To the heart of the matter, I guess uh, in the most pointed manner possible, maybe you could give us some sense of 
of what's happening right now, and then we'll move to why and what we should do about it. And, but as far as you're concerned, how should we be understanding the events that are unfolding in Ukraine? So um, several days ago, I've, I confess I've lost all track of, of time, um, but several days ago, uh, Vladimir, Russian President Vladimir Putin launched an unprovoked and unjustified and illegal attack on Ukraine uh, for the purpose of conquering. Now, all those, all those words are important. He um, Later, he will talk about what exactly is a nation. I don't know if I'll get that far in it because I'm mostly interested in the religious um, in the religious portion of the conversation. Um, he has conducted air and missile strikes against multiple, multiple targets across the entire country. And he has uh, launched a ground invasion along uh, multiple axes. His objective is very clearly to take control of the Ukrainian government in Kyiv, uh, but also to take control of a lot of other territory in Ukraine. He obviously aims at a minimum to replace the uh, pro-Western. Now, I, I heard I heard something on the news that Macron, that Putin had said to Macron, he intends to take the entire country, which is is significant in terms of whether or not there will continue to be an insurgency if, in fact, he does, because when you take an entire country, then if you're government becomes offshore and you try to launch insurgencies through, let's say, Romania and Poland, well, that's when tensions continue to escalate because there'll be, there'll be temptations on the part of the Russians to um, bomb on the other side of the border. Government headed by uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, Ukraine's current president, and install some kind of governance structure uh, that will bring Ukraine, um, as he sees it, back into the Russian fold. Uh, it's not at all obvious to me or anyone really what uh, kind of governance structure Putin has in mind at this point, uh, but it is very clear that he intends to do this at the point, at the, at the muzzle of the tank, um, and that he is willing to kill quite a lot of people and do quite a lot of damage in Ukraine uh, in order to uh, regain control of the country, and that is, that is that is what is going on. Uh, in short, it's part of a larger effort that Putin is engaged in to reconstitute the, the Soviet Union in some way, or possibly the Tsarist Empire in some way. Um, the, the geographies of the Soviet Union and the Tsarist Empire had interesting overlaps and underlaps, and it's important to keep in mind that Putin refers to both when he's talking about what his, uh, what his aims are. Um, and then just, you know, the last larger thing. You know, I think it's going to be helpful, too, to, again, think about Peterson's helicopter analogy when we talk about Putin. A human being is a very complex thing and um, sometimes frustratingly and sometimes delightfully inconsistent and unpredictable. And so we have, you know, I'm, I'm by no means a student of Putin, but... I'm all ears, and I continue to read your comments, and I continue to be interested in the subject, which obviously is, again, we, we live in this weird place where we feel ourselves participating in these dramas, and because we're participating in these dramas communally, then then we get, you know, personal about them, and, oh, I'm not going to talk to this person because they they disagree with me on, on who Putin is and who Russia is, and... Oh, okay. If you want to play that way, I, I'm very interested in a lot of different positions, and I'm very interested in hearing a lot of different theories, and then seeing who's right and who's wrong, and how they turn out. To zoom out from all of that, uh, he's been very explicit about his intention to destroy the NATO alliance, uh, to break the ties between the United States and Europe, uh, to change the world order fundamentally and to return the United States to what he regards as its proper sphere, which is uh, a Western hemispheric power. So let me let me ask you some questions about, about the way you answered that. So you started out by saying unprovoked, unwarranted, and illegal, and then you switched to, so I'd like to delve into that, why all of those? And then one, one might conclude that there's territorial ambitions here in some sense, but and he is moving troops into a large geographical area uh, of some... Peterson's playing with his wedding ring. I hope 
Kagan doesn't get the wrong idea. Value merely because it's a geographical area, but you also highlighted the importance of a of a uh, a shift in governance in Ukraine away from a pro Western governance structure. And so, how how much of this should we assume is territorial? Now, and this is an excellent question that Peterson asked, partly because again of the Mearsheimer assertion about liberal hegemony. And that, I think, underlies this conversation that different civilizations come to the come into the the arena with different presuppositions with respect to what is good, right, true, the way things ought to be. That is, in many ways, sort of the the foundation of pluralism. The foundation of pluralism is that, well, we come in with different assertions and that there's at least to a degree a toleration of different assertions, or at least we hold them loosely and we, we sort of talk together and work them out together and see if, in fact, we can't um, come to greater clarity. Now, most of us will probably remain in our own camp. Um, I am a Protestant and I prefer to live in a um, under a government that is democratically elected, I I believe in free speech and I believe in freedom of conscience and freedom of religion and all of these things. That's very much the way I was brought up and no one be, should be surprised by the fact that these are my presuppositional packages given the fact of when and where and to whom I was born. But we should at the same time remember that not everybody has such packages and that it's also true that not all such um, competitors in the arena necessarily, um, they're, they're not in some ways all sort of equal and right. There are better and worse. And part of, I think, what we do productively when we enter into the arena with our different presuppositions is we try as best we can to test our assumptions and hopefully, peacefully, another part of the package of the post-Reformational War, we, we try to um, discern the truth, imagining that there is a truth out there and that there is a better way to live and that if together we all pursue it, we all might gain from it. And So again, even as I critique my own presuppositions, I still hold them. And one of the things that comes about is within Christianity, there is a considerable power to critique itself. This comes about again and again and again. And you find this with Jesus. You find this with the Hebrew prophets. There's a, there's a tremendous power of self-critique. Now, this annoys people sometimes because, and quite rightly so, somebody left a comment that said, well, part of the American package is sort of this... Um, I'll call it a self-centeredness that imagines that we're responsible for the the invasion of Ukraine because Mearsheimer makes the point that, well, you know, and Kagan makes the point that, no, the, um, the Russians broke their agreement to guarantee Ukrainian sovereignty. Um, they just simply broke that. We are not responsible for the invasion of Ukraine. Um, we might have played our cards differently. And, and again, in this video, as is true of Peterson, I think he, he really tries to hold that balance well, and he articulates it where we, in fact, do have the capacity to be self-critical, but also to recognize that others are responsible for their own actions, and what Putin has done here is a violation of agreements that Russia has signed and is, I think, again, I think Putin is going to find he's going to get exactly what he was afraid of which is a rearmed and a re-energized NATO, seeing that Germany has now decided that they are not only going to send out over a whole bunch of old Soviet hardware to the Ukrainians, but they are going to dramatically boost their military spending. This is exactly the opposite of what Putin wants. And now again, we're going we're gonna to have to get into some of the religious aspects of it. So, in some sense. And so away from a pro-Western governance structure. And so how how much of this should we assume is territorial in some sense and how much of it is his his desire 
to create a subordinate state. Is it a, subord a state subordinate to him, or is it more important to him, do you think, that it's not pro-Western? His objective is very... And, and this gets into, again, some of the Mearsheimer point that a lot of us assume that, well, once people have the vote, then they'll vote in governments that we like. And some of you might remember not too long ago, a number of number of elections were had in the Islamist world, um, in the Islamic world, where, for example, Egypt democratically voted a government that a lot of people looked at and said, whoa, that's not going to go. And then, of course, there's a military takeover. We've seen this in, in many countries where elected governments um, – they are are put into power and the US doesn't like them even though they're democratically elected and the United States won't necessarily sit by if it imagines that its interests are threatened that's part of being you know the the empire that the kind of empire that America has become very explicitly to change the political order in Ukraine it's not about territorial conquest per se uh it's about ending Ukraine's uh, ambitions to join, to be part of the West to begin with. Uh, but he and, and I think this is right. And I think one of the things that we're watching through all of this is really the continued rise of soft power, that um, part of the game of a democratically elected government is manage the egregores that are working through, manage the spirits that are working through the people. He has written lengthy articles and he has given lengthy speeches um, explaining that he thinks that Ukraine has no right to exist as an independent state, uh, that it has no nationhood, uh, that it is simply a natural part of Russia that was reft from Russia uh, by the stupid Soviets and then by what he, you know the what he has called the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century which was the fall of the Soviet Union so it's 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 apparent from everything that he said okay now again the rest is history has done a whole slug of material lately on Ukraine and Russia and the history of the Rus and the connections with Constantinople very interesting history but before we get too far, this, this motivation of a lost glory is a theme that comes up. You can find that in, um, in Islamist movements, and I think we have it here in Russia. And you know, I was thinking about this, and at least to the um, – one of the things I'm going to say to my, my audience in the United Kingdom and all of those subjects of the realm in Canada and Australia – you know, you lost your big empire. At least you're not plaguing the world trying to get it back. Good on you. Now, but this also goes down to these, these religious presuppositions underneath. If you have a value of at least some degree of autonomy, subjects of the realm in England don't chafe every time they think about Australian or Canadian or or Indian or many countries in Eastern Africa, their independence. And, you know, to France had that episode with Algeria, but at least, hey, you Brits, good for you. Um, at least you let the uh, the children go and grow up. And um, but but again, that's part of the package of value. And it it's also important to remember that the history of the lost greatness of the Soviet Union is very recent. It's very recent. It's just the 1980s. It's not that long ago. And the humiliation is is a big is a big item and you can hear that when you listen to you know the fall of the Ottoman Empire is also not that long ago, end of the First World War, and it's it's undoing since then. And a big part of the motivation behind Osama bin Laden and his acts of terror were to try to recapture lost glory. And the same with ISIS. They were going to restart the caliphate. So this motivation of a recently lost glory and basically having, you know, 
history is fixed. You know, everybody, everybody's, you know, such and such is fixed. And I just know that if the proper processes were to maintain, then me and my beloved civilization, and even maybe me personally, would be sitting on top of the heap. Well, not usually. Says that his ult he has called the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century, which was the fall of the Soviet Union. So it's 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 apparent from everything that he says that his ultimate objective is to regain uh, full control over Ukraine in some way. Um, the exact way in which he would govern a reconquered Ukraine is not yet clear, but that he would re in, that he is insisting that it be in Russia's sphere of influence under Russia's control is not is not in question. So let, let's talk, let's ask about the, this idea of the Russian sphere of influence, because one of the things that puzzles me in some sense is why isn't Russia, why doesn't Russia conceptualize itself as part of the West? Like, why is Russia, why does Russia insist upon viewing itself as an entity independent of the West, especially given the fact that it isn't exactly obvious that Putin is an admirer of what happened under Lenin and Stalin in the Soviet Union? I thought this was a very interesting question. And I think he, I think he gets a good answer. I'm glad he asked the question because I think that probably a lot of, if, if we're living under sort of the, the glow of our time in the sun as the liberal hegemonic culture, why doesn't everyone want to live in a free democracy and free markets and you know deep in jordan peterson's mission has been well part of the reason that we ignore the bible at our own peril and and ignore the 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 fruits of western civilization is because it's best i mean that's part of his assumption now i don't know how much um Having again, having lived in, let's say, in the Dominican Republic, which was very much sort of a boundary water between, let's say, Latin culture and very a lot of influence of of North America in Latin America, and and part of that is again the continued rise of the Protestant Church in in Latin America. Um, many people just would say, well, why? Why doesn't everyone want to live like us? Why doesn't everyone want to think like us? Because thinking like I think and having our presuppositions and our assumptions, well, that's the best way to live. And of course, if that's a natural thing for all of us to believe, because if we didn't believe it, then you know we'd have other problems and we'd probably change the way we choose to live. So I think it's a good question. I think it gets a good answer. And so I don't understand why he why we have to have this notion that it's Russia against the West. It's why he doesn't trust the West, we don't trust him. Like, what, what's the dynamic? I know they're trying to find a fourth way or something like that philosophically in Russia. Why are- Now, now this also behind this question is, is sort of the question of, okay, so Marx, of course, comes out of Germany, he eventually goes to England. Um, to what degree is was the soviet union western and to what degree was the soviet union part of let's say and when i say western i am really talking about latin and to what degree is it the heir of this hybrid of slavs scandinavians and then later greek roman empire Greco-Roman Empire and Greco civilization, because again, if you listen to enough, listen to that recent "The Rest Is History" about when did Rome fall, and if you go back to that "Ready for Harvest" video that I played in the last video, oh, the Russians very much see themselves as part of the story, and then go back and watch Jonathan Peugeot's videos about universal history. Oh, they're very much a piece of this story. And that's why those universal history videos are so important because it shows how it's vital for all of us to maintain a conceptual map and maintain a location that we live within the conceptual map.
Why are we in this situation where Russia doesn't conceptualize itself as part of the West? I love this question. This is this is great because it, you, you let me get in, do, do some of my nerdly historian stuff here. To begin with, Russia has has never considered itself fully part of the West. Um, you know, when Peter the Great broke a window into Europe in the in the magical phrase of, of uh, Pushkin um, by establishing St. Petersburg, Peter attempted, who is one of Putin's two great heroes in Russian and Soviet history, the other one being Stalin. Um, you, you, you worry about a guy whose hero is Stalin. <laughs> um, Peter was trying to westernize Russia. And ever since then, there has been a debate within Russia about whether Russia really is Western or part of the West or whether it is something else. In the 19th century, this manifested itself particularly in the distinction in the divide in Russian intelligentsia between uh, Westerners and Slavophiles. And you had people like Leo Tolstoy um, arguing for the inherent uh, you know, Russian soul as mm -hmm. being distinctive and unique. Um, now, that's such a, it's helpful when we think about history in Europe to remember that you have the Northern Seas, the Baltic and the Northern Sea, and the civilization around that, which is of the Norsemen, and you have the civilization around the Mediterranean. Both of those were great civilizations, and the Scandinavian civilization meets the eastern part of the great Mediterranean Roman civilization in the Rus. In, and, and again, the rest of this history has been doing a nice job of laying out all that history. But it's, it's helpful to not just, when we think about that part of the world, think about the Mediterranean and the Roman. Also think about the Scandinavian and their great seafaring civilizations. Again, we seldom think about the Romans as a seagoing civilization, but like the Greeks, like the Phoenicians, the the Mediterranean was the superhighway of Rome, just like the Baltic and the North Seas are the superhighway of the Scandinavian civilizations. And they really come together historically in this Eastern civilization. And again, and their religion is orthodoxy. From the end of the Napoleonic Wars on, Russia politically has regarded itself as something more than European. And the acquisition of Russian is Asian territories, among other things, in the 19th century uh, has led Russians to see themselves as European and also. Throughout the 19th century, obviously, the West was Europe. You know, the United States was not a big player in being the West. In the 20th century, it's hard to know exactly where Russia would have gone, except that Bolshevism which triumphed in 1917, was an explicit rejection of the Western political economic model and a move in a different unique direction. So there is a narrative of Russian uniqueness and there is an inherent sort of Russian messianism and the messianism actually goes all the way back to Ivan. The okay, let's, before we get into the messianism, it's helpful to remember that civilizations have systems. And so one of the things that I want to get into at some point, I, those of you following me on Twitter know that I've posted some clips from a documentary about the Spanish-American War. And I think there are a lot, I think the Spanish-American War is instructive in helping Americans understood understand their religious substrata. Because part of what happens at the end of the Spanish-American War McKinley wants a base for coaling its navy in Asia because America has two coasts. America has to play both in the great Asian theater and in the European theater. And so this has obviously long been a part of the American picture, but there are civil wars, really wars of insurrection against Spain, their, colon their colonial Spanish masters, both in Cuba and in the Philippines. And the U.S. intervenes, in a sense, in one, wants to free Cuba, but 
has to, in a sense, the Spanish are pretty happy to get out of the Philippines because they're not making any money from it. So, after the U.S. beats up on Spain, which isn't terribly hard because it's very much an empire in decline, it finds itself in the possession of the Philippines. And the Philippines would like to be uh, sovereign. They would like to be independent. And the U.S., well, we'll get into that when we get into that story, but part of what the U.S. is concerned about is that not that other empires, they don't want the English or the Germans, because at that point the Germans would have loved to have um, taken the Philippines as a colony because the Germans were late to the Germans and the Italians because they were late to the nationhood game were also late to the colonial game, and that sort of sets up a bunch of other things that happen in the 20th century. Germany takes a few places in China because China is very weak. Um, Germany tries to, you know, tries to get sort of the, the the scraps of what the other major European colonial powers hadn't cleaned up, and so the U.S. decides, well, we'll keep the Philippines, but there's not a lot of appetite for the U.S. to really keep it in the way that England and France and Spain had run their, their colonial powers. So, but, but I say this to, to emphasize that there is a system in the world that can't be ignored. And again, this is sort of, again, this idea of one level up, that, that even the players in this system, the colonial players can't sort of turn, ignore because if they ignore it, they'll lose. And this is part of arms races. This is part of economic struggles. And, and this is part of where, let's say, civilizations on the decline, what they, what they, what they really face because suddenly they're being outperformed by other rivals. And so there's a lot, there's, there's these systems that, well, one, if you find a system that you're probably going to lose because everyone else got to the game early, you know, think about Elon Musk and Tesla. Well, what do you do? Change the game. And, and in many ways, the, the Soviet Union tried to change the game. It lost. Terrible. And I'm happy. The narrative of Russian uniqueness and there is an inherent sort of... This theme about uniqueness is also important. I think it's a function of consciousness and identity that when we sort of have a, a principality as an identity, it can be a national identity, it can be an ethnic identity, by virtue of how we work as consciousness, there's always a certain pride and a uniqueness. Now, I'm going to get some comments on this, but when I went to Australia, one of the things that I bumped into was a sense that there's sort of an inferiority complex in the Australian culture. I heard a couple of Australians make mention to that, and I thought, well, that's funny. I never really thought of that when I would think about Australians, but here these people mentioned it. They're Australian. It's like, well, was it because the your you know it, it, your nation was founded as a prison colony first? Is is that part of it? Um, so it's very interesting how cultures have identities and a certain sense of uniqueness. Now, again, when we get into religion. Moscow is the third Rome. Oh. And and again, go back and listen to a lot of the recent, the rest of this history about what is Rome? The power of Rome continues to live on. It's in American culture. Cincinnatus is, is still a hero in some ways behind so much American culture. The founding fathers of the United States were all classicists. 
you know, very much educated in the Erasmian tradition. There's a lot going on here. Russian messianism, and the messianism actually goes all the way back to Ivan the Terrible. And I'm happy to talk about that if you'd love to delve into, into ancient history. But all this stuff, is just, count me in, baby. This is this is fun. There are these strands in Russian thought going back centuries that Russia is a unique kind of place and that it must be a unique kind of place. And then, of course, as the Soviet Union was one of two global superpowers with the United States, Putin, when Putin is talking about the geostrategic calamity of the fall of the Soviet Union, what he really means is the loss of Russia's privileged position as one of the two rulers of the world. And what he is aspiring to is reestablishing that. Well, I've tried to understand this this Russian exceptionalism. I mean, I'm an admirer of Russian literature, and Solzhenitsyn certainly did um, feel that it would be appropriate for. As someone who likes playing the game civilization, you know what what goes into the greatness of a civilization. And again, the rest of history has talked about this too. You know, the literature, the art, the the stories of the people, um, you know, the the fact that the fact that Russia survived the Mongols, the fact that Russia and Ukraine and Poland survived, you know, the the 20th century. There's a there's a storied grit, and and there are you know there are elements of of, of Scandinavian um, culture in their culture as well. You know the. The, the ability to withstand the cold and to um, and not not to be destroyed by the elements and all of these things get into the greatness of a civilization and and exceptionalism is just the next domino over from greatness for Russia if it could throw off the shackles of its Soviet totalitarianism to return to the Russian Orthodox tradition that undergirded the Czarist regimes let's say and he felt that that would and of course the well how on earth did the scandinavians become orthodox well, listen to the rest is history um, that's i mean constantinople was rome and again we always use this word byzantine they called themselves romans a return to that would produce the foundation that would allow proper movement forward but that still to me doesn't exactly seem to justify claims that in some sense this is a non-Western enterprise. I mean, insofar as it's grounded in Orthodox Christianity, it's still grounded in Christianity, which makes it broadly... Ah, but the differences within Christianity are not insubstantial. ...Western, and I've tried to understand... Uh, uh, but, 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 but no, but not... not okay. Not, not, in, not in the Russian historical conception, because the... The, the messianism of that is, was established under um, the, the Ivan uh, the Ivan rulers was the notion of Moscow as the third Rome, and the argument was that there, first there was Rome and Christianity was founded there. Christianity moved to Constantinople, and then when Constantinople fell in 1453, the Russian Orthodox Church began to make the argument that the center of Christendom had moved to Moscow, which was the inheritor of the true faith. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. in that sense, it is a line of Christianity that does not, that rejects sort of Rome as the center anymore, runs through mm -hmm. Constantinople to Moscow and claims to be its own center. And so mm -hmm. even in that sense, Christ, defining Christianity as a Western thing in this sense is problematic within the ideological framework that Putin and others operate in. Well, they, so now, just like there's sort of a an exceptionalism built into our own identity and consciousness with respect to let's say our tribe or our ethnicity the same is of course also true of one's religion if you don't believe in your religion you'll change it and and you have to re believe that your religious perspective is best because why would you continue to believe in it if you didn't so they see that as more embedded in the Byz in in the remnants of the Byzantine Empire and and yeah. and in the separate. And again, there's the language because I and Peterson and I, you know, the Byzantine, the Byzantine, and they didn't call themselves Byzantine; they called themselves Roman. Well, why do we call them Byzantine? Oh, because we believe we're star still part of Rome, too. This universal history 
it's really important. I mean, that's that's a lot of what Jonathan and and um, Richard Rowland are doing on his channel. That's important stuff. This stuff still matters. Operation from Constantinople and Rome a very long time ago. Correct. And do you know anything about the relationship between the Orthodox Christian uh, authority hierarchy in Russia and the hierarchies of authority in Rome? Are, are the relationships good or do the Orthodox, does the Orthodox... Talk about complex. Orthodox hierarchy itself regard itself as something separate entirely and in opposition to the... Oh, the it is. And, and again, go back to that, um, go back to that ready for harvest video that I linked and played a little bit of before. It's 11 minutes. He's very concise, unlike me, and just boom, 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 boom. And again, that's just the survey. That's just the summary. Whoops. It is separate. The, the, the mm -hmm. Orthodox hierarchy in, in Russia does not um, regard itself as under the under the edict no but are the, the are the relationships friendly and and is there communication or is there's communication and successive popes have reached out to uh patriarchs to to talk uh with them but one of the things that it's important to understand is that putin has carried on the tradition of the tsars um of subordinating the moscow patriarchate to himself and so the the it now read Tom Holland's Dominion or um, Tom Holland's Millennium. What's the other name for that one? Um, the Forge of Christianity, something like that. All of that European history really in many ways the, the, the question in the West of who's on top? Is it the, is it the priests? Is it the bishops or is it the civil magistrates? This runs through the Protestant Reformation. This, this precedes the Protestant Reformation in, in European his, history. The struggle, why does, why does Charlemagne insist on being crowned Holy Roman Emperor by the Bishop of Rome? The ghosts of Rome continue to rule the <laughs> Eurasia, and, and many other places in the world. It is it the Moscow Patriarchate at this point is fundamentally an arm of the Russian government. And so... Wow. He controls it de facto. Uh, it is not an independent of religious authority in reality, even though it is ostensibly. And so... And, and this is where, you know, when we start talking about... You know, when Americans are talking about orthodoxy... It's like, well, that's that's in a very Protestant way. That's just another church on the menu that I can go to. But can orthodoxy and democracy coexist? Would an orthodox culture be a democratic culture? And if, in fact, an orthodox country being democratic... Would that, how exactly would that work in terms of consistency with the worldviews and the way they're put together? Or is that, again, that little piece of a conversation that we had in The Thief of the Night, is that sort of Protestant code being built into orthodox assumptions below the consciousness level? There's worlds of difficult questions that we have to deal with right now, and, 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 Part of what we're bumping into in these conversations and and in these subjects are is this its relations with the Vatican or whatever Putin decides he's willing to have them be at any given moment. I don't think I don't understand there to be a particularly contentious relationship, except um, and it wasn't with the Vatican actually. Most recently, if you want to get really nerdly on this, there was a big fight a couple of years ago because the Ukrainian Orthodox Church had been a component or subordinated to the Moscow Patriarchate. Um, the formal uh, leader of all of the Orthodox uh, communities is in um, Constantinople, is in, I want to say Constantinople, is in Istanbul. He wants to say Constantinople for a reason. 
And a few years ago, I forgot exactly when, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church petitioned the uh, patriarch in Istanbul to grant it autocephaly, to make it independent mm -hmm. of... Now again, watch the Ready for Harvest video, because that's where you bumped into that word. ...the Moscow Patriarchate, and that was granted. And so the Ukrainian Orthodox Church has become an independent uh, entity directly under the Constantinople. And when we in the Protestant world hear independent, that's kind of different from the autocephalous. Noble, uh, the Istanbul uh, Patriarch. And the, Putin mm. bitterly resented that, hated it, mm. cr attacked it. Uh, and it was it is one of his grievances that, in fact, that that occurred. That was not done by. The and you thought in the West that church matters and ecclesiastical matters don't really mean anything. The Pope that was done by the uh, patriarch right. in uh, Istanbul. Well, people might be wondering why we've taken a detour into a religious direction. But the answer is we're trying. I'm not wondering. I'm delighted. Trying to sort out the issue of the degree to which Russia rightly regards itself as an autonomous community independent of the West. And in order to answer that question properly, you have to delve down to the bottom of the cultural separation. And near the bottom is, well, the relative autonomy of the Orthodox Church. And I have talked to people in Washington who are associated with the Orthodox Church in Russia, and they do claim that Putin goes to confession and that there is some validity to his claims to have adopted some approximation of Orthodox Christianity. That now, now, there's another little Western filter that, well, all serious people subordinate their religion to realpolitik. Really? No, not at all. That obviously leaves open the issue of what the relationship is between the political power and the church power. It doesn't seem to be entirely unidirectional. And one of the things that also is a mystery to me in relationship to that is that you can trace a fairly clear line of development of democratic thought in the West proper to Protestantism in particular, which is grounded in Christianity. And there's a fair bit of emphasis on individual sovereignty and Orthodox Christianity. Now, I don't know, and maybe someone will enlighten me in the comments section, but a big part of the current unhappiness in the American Roman Catholic tradition between the Chad, the Chads, the Trads, the Trad Chads, and, and sort of the current regime is this question of, of synods and synodical rule. Part of what happens in the Protestant Reformation is, is that the, the Protestant church's very much come down, and my tradition in particular, the Christian Reformed Church and the Dutch Reformed Church, very much come down on the sides of councils. So in the Christian Reformed Church, we have three layers of councils. We have a, a synod, which is a binational body, and then we have our classes. It's the meeting I went to early this week and the meeting I have to go to in Salt Lake as a synodical deputy for another for the synod to the other classes, and then the local church council. And the Christian Reformed Church has that three-tier system. Someone recommended the book Vatican I to me, and I got a good ways through it and just found the book absolutely fascinating in terms of the the ultramontanism of we're, we're going to have a, a very strong pope. And and the pope, you know, you've got then you've got the power of the pope versus the power of the of the of the of the synod or the council or basically the assembled body and the struggle between those two and and you see that of course echoed in the american system of government where you have the legislative the executive and the judicial branches and so you have this division of power and this is part of what happens when you have it's in a, in a sense way of expressing these, these different powers. And I don't know the way that history goes in the East, but I'm positive it has a history because in many ways, these tensions are inherent right at the beginning of Christianity, where Paul goes around basically selecting individuals to be leaders of individual churches, yet you have the Jerusalem Council where 
they all get together and decide together. So you have this tension in Christianity between the individual leader and the body. Because Jesus says, you know, you're all brothers. You have one master and you're all brothers. So this tension in Christianity between hierarchy and and equality, it just doesn't go away. And it gets expressed in our ecclesiastical systems, which then get carried on and expressed in our political systems. Christianity, but there wasn't a development into a, into a democratic polity in the same way there was, especially in Northern Europe. And I can't, I, I can't really understand why that is. It doesn't seem to be a doctrinal issue exactly that stems from the, the faith itself, it, but I, I well, don't have I don't... any more. I'm, I am, I'm going, I'm about to reach the limit of, of expertise that I'm comfortable talking about, but I will, I will make the observation that one of the central characteristics of Protestantism is that apart from um, England after Henry VIII, Protestantism was independent of state control. Right, right. And even Catholicism was independent of state control for most of the history of the West. Now, Again, this is even during the COVID. In the United States, we have the First Amendment. And churches in California that didn't want to wear masks and didn't want to shut down took the government to court and won because the Establishment Clause is really deep in the American system. Not so much in Australia, Canada, and the UK because your head of state is also the head of the church in some ways, at least the protector of the church. So so this stuff, even though for contemporary Westerners thinks this is just all archaic stuff, none of this matters. Oh no, it still matters. After the fall of Rome. And so um, that I think it's very, that independence from state control has been an important element in allow, in, in the fact that Western religion, that Christianity in the West it's created space, as it were, by, right, by creating this separation, this gap between church and state, in mm -hmm. which... At the level of detail, at right. the level of legislation and, and actual interactions between the church and the state. Yeah, and just the... I mean, this is, what, you know, of course, why Henry VIII, one of the reasons Henry VIII took control of the, uh, you know, went to the Protestant Anglicanism and took control of his own church, because he was aggravated at having the Pope, um, you know, being, have, have a say in anything. But in most other countries in Europe, the Pope continued to have a say in things for a long time, and it created a little bit of space. That was never the case in Russia. We never had an independent patriarch who could create that space from the Tsars um, into which there, you know, something else could happen because it, it was always fundamentally, um, at least in the from the Muscovite period on, it was uh, the Orthodox Church was always fundamentally under the control of the Tsar. And so it was a state religion and it was not, it just did not have the ability to create that kind of uh, space. And then there's a bunch of other sociocultural reasons that, you know, as a historian, I'd love to nerd out about why the Russians didn't develop Western traditions of, of uh, personal liberty and independence and that kind of stuff. But this religious aspect has to do with state capture, state control of the church, I think, more than anything else. Right. So I'd love to hear him nerd out on this stuff. This is, this is, this is, this is cool too much integration at the top, which is, that's how Mussolini defined fascism in some sense, although he was thinking more about it in terms of collusion between the corporate world and the, and the political world. But so you need autonomous organizations as close to the top as you can right. get. At, at, at least that's work, That's how it's worked in the West. Okay, so we've talked about why Russia might regard itself as somehow importantly separate. I mean, you could also say that about any number of countries within yes. the West. It's not like Germany and England are the same place or France and England or France and the United States. We've been able to develop a, an integrated West to some degree that also allows for autonomy. So I still can't exactly see why the Russians can't be brought under that umbrella. Certainly the idea that they've lost. I hear this kind of stuff so often and, and it's not just in politics, it's in churches and why don't why don't you just want to be part of our thing? Because maybe I don't like your thing. Maybe I like my thing. Maybe I want you to be part of my system. That's 
lost their empire and they've lost their central place. Uh, that there's a I don't know if there's a resentment that goes along with that or, or well, a confusion you, about place. Yeah, before you even get there, I mean, look, it, it, you can't understate the importance of the Bolshevik Revolution in this regard mm -hmm. because. The Romanov dynasty, especially in the 19th century, regarded itself as a part of Europe as well as something more. It regarded itself as European plus, um, and it regarded itself as a sort of a European superpower, but it regarded itself as part of the concert of Europe and a pillar of the concert of Europe. So the change comes when you have a revolutionary cabal take power that is dedicated to the destruction of all of the fundamental principles of the West. And that was the but that was the Bolshevik Revolution, and it took it took control, and it imposed its ideology by brute, unbelievably brutal force on a population that didn't start believing in it, and that ideology involved not only that the every aspect of the socio political economic structure of the West was evil, but that it was seeking to destroy Russia, and that it was seeking mm -hmm. to destroy the this virtuous Bolshevik Revolution. So mm -hmm. we can talk about the, you know, the historical Russian theories of encirclement and various other things, um, which frankly can be easily overstated when you go back into Russian history. But the Bolsheviks absolutely saw themselves as the, the, the kernel of a world revolution and assumed naturally that the entire capitalist world was seeking to destroy them. And to be fair to them, of course, the initial reaction of the Western powers was, in fact, to try to crush the Bolshevik Revolution. And, and this, again, is where we get well, different systems want to live. Different spirits want to endear, endure. They want supremacy. You, you, you don't want to be a part of our Western democracies. Why don't you want to be a part of our communist system? Surely it's the wave of the future. You know, you'll, you know, we will crush you. You'll be in the dustbin of history. That's what, that's what Marxist ideology said. But what we're, te what we tend to be blind to is our ideology, which is that, well, once we help you see that, that, Clearly, our systems are superior to yours. You'll adopt them. This is this is the this is the liberal hegemony. Surely, once we go into Iraq and liberate them from Saddam, Saddam's the only thing standing in the way of them becoming a a free market um, situation. Surely, they'll come our way. And we did have American troops land in Russia in during the Civil War to try to help the white forces defeat the Bolsheviks. So there was an initial Western, and the British and the French did too. So there was an initial sort of Western intervention against the Bolshevik revolution, which gave just a little bit of color to this. But the anti-Westernism and the notion of an encirclement and being at permanent war with the entire capitalist world is inherent to Marxism and Leninism. And then what did the Bolsheviks do? They systematically cut the Soviet society off from the world and took all control of communication. Now, now, pay attention to that. Cut them off from the world. Well, what is the world? Well, the world is our system. They established their own world. And, you know, again, I, I recommend Tim Snyder's Bloodlands where he goes, he, he basically shows how you have these two systems. You had the, the democratic socialists of the Nazi party and you had the Stalin and the communists and and they just go over Poland and Ukraine and they keep trying to the Nazis believe that well if we just get rid of all of these structures well then sort of the 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 ecological nativistic things will flourish and the the supremacy of the German race will become self-evident oh and of course the the communists well if we just get rid of all of this capitalist oppression, well, then the the naturalness of our system, well, don't we believe that just democracy and free markets are just the natural way of life? Of course we believe that. But everyone does. Vacations prevented people from leaving the Soviet Union. It's one of the ways that you can tell uh, a legitimate state from a prison with a government.
is does it allow its people freely to leave? And the Soviet Union did not. The Soviet Union, mm -hmm. you know, the laws prevented people from leaving without special permissions and so on. And it, so it, it was a prison so with that's a government. The certain, but, but, but even that's more complex because I just watched Shawshank Redemption spend 30, 40 years institutionalized and then come out. No, we're we're very sophisticated creatures and we're very easily formed. I was having a conversation with someone who lives on the street there and we were we we were having he was having a debate in himself whether he should be institutionalized because he says I know I know what it means to be institutionalized. And the certain hallmark of a totalitarian society exactly. is that you cannot, it's a prison, essentially. Right, exactly, right. Mm -hmm. So that was so just the so Russians, so that you think there's inertia in some sense, even though Russia is no longer a Bolshevik state, you think there's inertia in the distrust of the West that probably developed even before the Bolshevik re revolution. Not, I, I don't think that there was a huge amount of inertia along those lines among Russians themselves. But now we need to talk about Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, who was a KGB, a mid-rank KGB thug, who claims never really to have believed in the communist claptrap that he was putting out, which mm -hmm. is which wouldn't make him unique among the Soviet apparatchiki, um, but who nevertheless obviously imbibed a sense of Soviet patriotism and some kind of belief in aspects of that ideology, and has certainly accepted the Soviet theory that the West, that the world is out to get Russia and accepted that paranoiac doctrine. Because I mean, as you, as you know, George, we're not out to get you. We want what's best for you. Ideologies are large, sprawling and complex. People can believe in parts of them while rejecting mm -hmm. other parts of them. <laughs> I'd, I'm willing to believe that Putin was never a committed communist per se. But it is apparent that Putin accepted the special destiny of the Soviet Union or Russia in the world to be a superpower and to have influence beyond the norm and accepted that the world was hostile and was seeking to prevent the Soviet Union or Russia from having. And, and if you look at the history of the 20th century in Russia, you look at how many Russians were killed by the Nazis. You know, all he has to do is, like he's doing right now, go on TV and say, we're trying to get rid of the Nazis. And I deal with this on individual and basis, and Peterson does too. Find someone who has trust issues, let's say, and difficulty trusting. Get them to talk about their past. Oh, the people that should have been trustworthy in their lives were not. Guess what? The rest of their life, they struggle with, can I trust you? Can I really trust you? I'm suspicious. Well, of course you're suspicious. Look at how you were treated. And that, that also goes to cultures and these principalities, these one level up powers that, that possess us. You have, you have suspicious cultures. And yeah. In that role. Okay. So then is it, is it the case then that, and this is part of the expression of political uh, what variability in opinion that you hear expressed in the United States right now. It's, it was definitely the case, and correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that after the Soviet wall fell, that the West did take steps quite rapidly to try to consolidate some of the border territories between the, well, the former Soviet Union and the West and to invite the Baltic states and so forth into a much closer partnership with the West. And a lot of that happened quite quickly. And then U Ukraine was sort of left at, in, be, in an in-between state for a long time. So it didn't get moved west as fast as some of the other well, states did. Yeah, can it, I, I mean, I'd like to clean up the history here because I, I think the, okay. I think, I think good, the, good. The, the, the details matter. So the Soviet Union formally ends at the end of uh, 1991. Um, there, is, there is discussion about exactly what's going to happen to Germany and about whether East Germany is going to become a part of NATO and the Russians have a certain idea of what we of what they were told and we have a different idea of what they were told there were no formal commitments one way or another but it ended with germany being reunited and then all of germany remaining in nato um 
there was no further expansion of NATO until 1997. Okay, so that's very important. It is not like in, in 1990, it's not like the year after the Soviet Union fell, NATO expanded. Nor is it the case that the messages were, that were going from the West to Russia were, we're going to take all of the non-Russia parts of the former Soviet Union into NATO, but you Russians need to stay out. You're the adversary. On the contrary, NATO reached out to Russia also, and NATO established a Partnership for Peace program, and Russia was a member of the Partnership for Peace program, along with all of the other former Soviet states. And NATO did offer various forms of technical assistance. The U.S. formed various for offered various forms of technical assistance uh, to Russia in the 1990s, uh, most of which the Russians um, rejected, some of which they accepted, which were, which were very important. And there was a lot of cooperation because it's important to note that when Boris Yeltsin was president, he did not identify the West as the enemy. He sought to integrate into the West. He sought to westernize Russia, and he, and he did to a considerable extent. And he sought to democratize Russia, and he did. And he had to fight off multiple efforts by the Communist Party of the former Soviet Union to regain power and reestablish communist rule. And he fought against that, and we, tried, we, we did try to help him with that. Now, this whole part of the video I thought was excellent. And I have to wrap this up because I have to catch a plane. But, again, it's helpful to remember that from this sort of the liberal hegemonic viewpoint, well, the, the Communist Party should be just another political party. But are they? Europe is having the same kinds of conversations with respect to Islam. Let's say if in one of the Western democracy, an Islamist party grew in prominence. Well, is the goal of the Islamist party to, once you gain supremacy, to maintain it forever? Because after all, you know what's best. In the West, we say, no, you can't do that. Well, you, you know, the Communist Party has to be like the Social Democrats or like the Liberal Democrats or like one of the other parties because that's the system. If you don't buy the system, you gain power and you keep it. And Putin sort of had some mission creep and electedly popular elected, blah, 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 and then just did not leave an office anymore, you know? And so, and these systems are built into other foundations and those foundations matter. And those foundations for the most part are historical and the deepest ones are religious. Well, I have to end the video here, but Every now and then I still get a comment. You keep interrupting the video. Well, then watch the original, please. Anyway, I just wanted to offer some comments, especially on the religious history and, and some of the religious assumptions here. And well, again, I haven't finished the entire video. I'm about three quarters of the way through. And I'll finish that on the plane. But I wanted to get this in the can. And I think I'll just release this for Friday morning. So thanks for watching.